sound is important. Great. OK. Um, so I work uh, on an in-house design team inside the New York Times. Um, and we're about 30 people, and collectively, we're responsible for designing everything that's not the print paper. So the websites, the apps, emails. Um, but this talk is specifically going to be about the website redesign um, that we released in January of this year. And I'll just go over a few of the different ideas that we've been trying out. Uh, in 2013, or the late t 2012, um, when we began the redesign process, this is what the website looked like. Um, it had been designed about 10 years ago by Razorfish and had not really changed. Um, we had made a couple of, of adjustments, and we put Cheltenham, which is the main in-house headline typeface, on the home page for special occasions like the elections. but. For the most part, um, we had not pulled in our typographic identity that was in print onto the web in a, in a big way. And like, like you probably know, for most newspapers, there's a very complex typographic system for treating relationships, for treating different types of content, um, for treating different elements within those pieces of content. And all of that um, had been missing in translation on the web. There was just this one template. It was Georgia. Um, this is the redesign homepage. We moved, not, not much has really changed. We moved the navigation out of the side and onto the top, um, which let us simplify the grid down there. But this is not that interesting. Um, we spent most of our time working on the article page. This is the article page. Um, I'll just show a couple more versions of this. And the first thing that you'll notice is um, the headline um, headlines are all different depending on the type of content that it is. So for something like um, something that's very political or something that's very newsy, uh, we, we use a bold italic uh, chel just to give it some urgency. And then when we get to the movie section or the, the food section, we, we have something more leisurely. Um, opinion has something else, and we, you know, have their image. Um, when there's subheads, we um, have something below. Um, our weekly supplement is another thing called the magazine, and it has its own um, typographic identity. So that's the first thing you'll notice. And the second thing you'll notice is that none of these layouts look the same. Um, the images and the text column and the ads, they're all shifting depending on um, the content. So there's a few variations. And in fact, there's over 120. I've stopped counting. Um, and the variation is not being manually selected or changed by any of the journalists or the producers. The layout behaves differently based on attributes inherent in the content itself or unique to each user. Um, so these are just a few of those attributes. The type of story, right? Is it hard news? Is it something more casual? Is it a feature story? Um, the type of lead media that's there, is, it a, is there something vertical, horizontal? Is it a small, medium, large, jumbo image? Um, what viewports there are uh, the user is using? And we don't limit it to just you know, uh, portrait tablet landscape tablet, desktop, large desktop. We have a lot of breakpoints in between. And then, of course, ads affect that layout as well. Um, and so at any given point, there's a combination of um, factors that determine what the layout is. Um, and so there doesn't have to be one or two or three rigidly defined templates. All of these factors interact with, um, oops, interact with each other, and they affect one another. And uh, we work on individual combinations when we make layout changes. Uh, so you get you have to handle an exponential number of combinations. Um, and in this way, you build a design system that continues to evolve um, as you add new layers and new dimensions in the future. 
Um, another thing that we do when we work on these layouts is we distribute article assets throughout the page. Um, the layout engine tries to space assets out evenly if there's room, and we call that process basically sprinkling down the page. Um, or if someone wants to intervene and tie an asset to a specific point in the article, they can tie it to a paragraph, um, and that asset will will remain there while everything else remains sprinkled. So if there is a mix and there's two items that are manually placed and there are three other items that are sprinkled, the layout system is smart enough to um, space the three, uh, the sprinkle the three away from the manually placed elements. So this is a very simple example. This is a more complicated one and you can see all the assets of different sizes and the layout engine is making sure all there are no collisions happening. Now design, uh, creating design systems like this sounds like a very obvious thing to do. Um, as a designer, that's the way you think. You think in terms of relationships, you think of, um, you put the headline here and you, um, you put another button to the right edge of that but you match the top edge of the headline to the top of that button. Um, but then you have to translate it to HTML and CSS and usually that leads to a very static template or a very static artifact. Um, and if you then take a step back and embed your, your design system, your, your rules into um, your HTML and CSS and your JavaScript, if you begin introducing logic, you can arrive at solutions that are very, very adaptable and very variable while letting you um, letting you maintain control. So, because they're just simply following a set of rules that you're prescribing. Um, as a step-by-step -step example, just to be a little more specific, I'm gonna talk about the slideshows um, that launch when you are in an article and you click on a slideshow. It opens it up as a modal and the obviously the goal is to show case the image as large as possible within your viewport. Um, now every user's viewport can be a different size, both in width and height, but also in terms of aspect ratio. And the images are also can vary very, very highly in terms of width and height and aspect ratio. So you can do some math to figure out what the ideal size should be. So if this is your browser viewport, and you start with putting basic Chrome elements in. You put the headline in the top center. You put the close button in the upper right corner and you put navigation arrows in the lower right corner. And then you define this canvas area that's um, intentionally 30 pixels away from each of the elements that are already there. And of course that aspect ratio depends on your browser viewport. And then you define two variations that are possible. You can have an image and a caption um, in a top-down arrangement, or you can have a side-by-side -side, side -side arrangement. And all the type sizes and colors and positioning are defined. And what that means is you can get any, uh, you can support any browser size uh, up, to, up to certain points, but um, you can always guarantee that the image is displaying as large as possible. Um, obviously, the side-by-side -side layout tends to work better for vertical images, and the above-below layout works better for horizontal images, but not always. If you have an extremely vertical viewport like this, sometimes you might, it would, it would be better for the caption to be below. And sometimes you may have a portrait tablet or a very tall phone, like the iPhone 6 or something. So, you know, but let the computer do what it's good at. Um, so this happens all the time on native platforms. This happens um, in apps where you do a lot of calculations. Um, but this doesn't seem to be that widespread online. And so maybe this is controversial. I, I don't know. But um, it really irritates me when designs are described as being app-like. Um, an app is, runs on a computer and your browser is running on a computer and you can do basic computations and you can do basic logic. There's very, very little that um, happens in editorial design that um, 
is performance uh, is bad for performance. So um, there are things like 3D modeling or physics modeling where you probably wouldn't want to do that all in a browser. Um, but editorial design systems are just not that heavy. Um, you come up with a system and then you let it play out wherever it is. Um, you know, whether that's on the web or uh, in a native app. Um, and you can imagine how our uh, typographic treatments and layout um, systems can vary or can, can apply just as much to uh, a native iPhone or iPad app. The, var the various details might be different, um, so you can take advantage of what's available um, in that environment, but that's fine. The system is about making sure your core ideas come across. Um, and if you work with typefaces or if you design typefaces, this is, should be a familiar idea. Um, entire families or entire grades of typefaces are um, begin with the idea of what you want the typeface to be, and then you make uh, modifications or you make variations based on that um, across different media. Um, one of the things that we did when we brought web fonts onto um, the website is we began using Cheltenham at really small sizes. Um, and that doesn't really quite work. Um, we didn't have a text version. Um, and then, so for a while, we were experimenting with using ITC Cheltenham this might be kind of hard to see, but the X height you can see is a little bit taller. Um, it's a lot more readable, but um, the strokes are a lot more heavy compared to our in-house chelt. So it became um, a lot uh, stronger than we would like it to be. Uh, we commissioned Matthew Carter to draw us a text version of Cheltenham, and um, it actually has almost the exact same metrics as Georgia. Uh, so this is Georgia. Um, this is Georgia compared to the text Cheltenham. And you can see it's essentially identical. We're just changing some of the ways we handle the G or, um, or the A stroke. But it's more or less the exact same. Um, and it looks really good. Um, and then we also adapted our in-house Franklin Gothic. Um, around the time that we were redesigning, Font Bureau was releasing their Reading Edge series, um, and that was perfect because we needed uh, we needed a sans that worked well from nine pixels to fourteen pixels. Um, and the Franklin Gothics originated from Morris Fuller Benton, which you probably know, and so uh, Benton Sans was very much uh, is very very similar. And those are the characters that we. Um, did change in Benton Sands when we created a new Franklin. Um, the uppercase A and Q, the lowercase A, G, and the numerals 2 and 9. This hasn't been released on the website yet, but it will come out soon. But the Cheltenham has been released. Um, so now I'll just talk about a few experiments and um, the disclaimer it comes with a disclaimer that you shouldn't expect any of these to see the light of day, but they're just interesting to think about. Um, so to use our type text typefaces, um, we knew that we want to definitely use them once the font size goes below a certain um, size. So uh, because we are using a CSS preprocessor, and every time we uh, set font properties, we're already using a font mix-in. Uh, this is just a very simple example where we can look at the size and the family that's being used, and if it's below a certain threshold, you can switch over to the Cheltenham SH or the Franklin UI. Um, this is very simple. Uh, there are other efforts that are similar, like Matthew Carter's MS Sitka. Maybe that's how you pronounce it. Um, or Apple's dynamic type. And that embeds the logic into the font itself or the operating system itself. And that's also interesting, but um, this is something 
that is helpful for us because there are so many developers touching the website that it would be nice to just have it work automatically. Um, another great thing to have is to avoid these types of headlines. Um, having poll there on the second line is hideous. And, but there are other things we could avoid too. Um, the second line should always be longer than the first. Um, and lines should not break after words like the, for, by, a, and, to, a, anything that's not capitalized. So again, you can embed that, um, that logic in, into JavaScript. Um, that's the original headline on the right, and the modified is on the left. And the rules are basically it's looking for eligible word spaces, and it's, um, you can see it's not uh, highlighting the word space between by and a on the first headline. Um, and then it looks for the word space that's um, closest to the half point, but before the half point, because that when you break that, then the second line will always be longer. Um, ideally, we would find a way for the, the script to work regardless of the content width or the font or the exact headline length. But right now, this only works for um, the Cheltenham and Franklin, like basically, basically for, specifically for our article. But there's no reason why it couldn't be more general. Um, and this is Bram Stein's thing, which we all already know about, so I'll skip over it. Um, but it's pretty cool. You would use it on body type. It's pretty performance heavy. So again, these are just things that we did. Um, there's always performance concerns with um, doing anything with JavaScript, but you should just look at, at, these, as, at these as enhancements. Um, there's no reason that you shouldn't use JavaScript if it doesn't um, if it doesn't mean you break your website when it's not available. Um, and you should ev evaluate each of these things um, individually. We probably would never do our own manual hyphena hyphenation and justification on our body type, but a lot of these other things we feel very comfortable with. So yeah, that's all I have. The very front of Frank. How do people react when you change stuff? Because that's normally a big issue with Germans. I don't know about the US market. Uh, it was pretty mixed in terms of reaction, which uh, I take that as a good sign. Um, it was about 50-50. And I mean, for a website that hasn't changed in 10 years, that I feel very good about that. Um, yeah. One thing that people did say was they hated how all the fonts got smaller, which was not true. Like everything got bigger, so. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Alan.